the, the, the first step of this discourse is to somewhat realize that there is no such a thing as uh, ideological zero ground. There is no such thing as a belief neutral ground, that there is no such a thing as exit from a belief system. So we have a tendency to compare belief systems to non-belief systems. Uh, that is the first fallacy. And the second fallacy seems to be that we, compare, we, we tend to equal the non-belief systems with knowledge systems. We somehow have this incorporated in our head that knowledge is the opposite of belief. Now, where this notion came from is, uh, I think, um, worth another seminar. For, for, for our purposes here, let me just note a little linguistic fact. Um, of course, we very much believe, we believe that belief and knowledge is on the opposite side of the, the uh, continuum. But in normal language, we readily substitute the word I know and I believe. So for example, in, in the world of economics, it is the same thing to say, I think we will grow 4.2%. It is also the same thing to say, I believe we will grow 4.2%. So again, in theory, Knowledge and belief seems to be mutually exclusive, but ironically, in everyday language, we confuse the terms every single sentence or every single other sentence. <clears throat> now, of course, uh, one cannot be in an ideological vacuum. One cannot be in a belief vacuum, and uh, one belief replaces the other. Now, uh, it is commonly said that we live in the post-ideological times. Uh, as one of the mo more controversial philosophers that came from the East and South, Slavoj Žižek puts it, um, nothing is further from the truth. We live in the most ideological time of all. Why? because we consider our beliefs to be the true fact of reality. You will say, but before we believed whatever we believe today, economics, science, mathematics, rigorous rational analysis, those are the gateways to knowledge. Before we had those, we had religion and we believed that religion blindly. Well, let's examine which one of the two we believed more blindly. If not for anything else, our forefathers would go to church, that was a recognized act of belief, and in that church, once a week, <clears throat> they would repeat to themselves what it is that they believe. Every Sunday they would go, I believe in you know, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and whatnot. Doesn't really matter. The important point in this argumentation is that they knew that those are beliefs. I believe, I'm not sure, I believe in all sorts of whatever they wanted to believe. That's not important, the, the, um, the object of belief is not as important as the belief itself. It was a belief. And I might even say with a little bit of uh, historical courtesy that these people were proud of their beliefs for reasons that we don't really understand. Today, we no longer believe, we know. And that, of course, is the home run of any ideology is to appear like knowledge. So in other words, we have lost the arm's length from our beliefs. We take them too readily. Uh, we were just talking with my dear friend outside smoking, if I may say so. It's still not uh, a deadly sin. Uh, 
And I was saying, you know, according to science, the probability of the world existing as it is without any divine intervention is 0.0000000001%. That needs a lot of belief. And to be fair, and here I'm not lobbying for one side of the argument or for the other side of the argument, I just want us to be rigorous. If we believe whatever we believe with 0 0.06, 0 0.1 to the minus 6, why don't we give the same probability to the other alternative? That would only be fair. Now, of course, um, uh, let, me let me try to demonstrate how myths become beliefs in my field, which is economics. Um, <clears throat> You can, of course, apply this to, to Descartes and, and, and others, but there I'm not so uh, well acquainted as I am in economics. So this is how economic truths come about. Two economists meet early in the morning, um, and one says to another, what shall we do? Well, let's create a model. And the other one says, okay, okay, let's, let's, let's create a model. How shall we start? Let's start with assumptions. Okay, so let's assume, for example, that human beings like yellow socks. I don't know. Let's try something else. Okay, let's assume that human beings like to wake up and jump on their left leg. leg. And nothing else? Let's assume that human beings are rational. Oh, okay, that sounds good. That sounds like a rational uh, thing to do for economists. And then, they, then we build the model, and uh, we have the model gives you certain conclusions. So far, so good. Whatever you believe is fine. Your axioms or your assumptions or your articles of belief are completely random. You can really believe that people like yellow socks. It's a technical assumption, has nothing to do with reality. We have been through this many times. Assumptions don't have to be real, and in fact, they're not real. Um, they just need to be functional. Now, uh, so far, so good. The problem begins the moment these two economists in the evening Come to a pub, meet people like you, philosophers, thinkers, artists, sociologists, psychologists, dancers. And, uh, and these two economists say, you know what we discovered today? That human beings are rational. The mathematics works much better if we assume that. It, it's, and this is exactly the moment where something which was a technical assumption in the morning became an article of faith in the evening. Today, economists engage with ethicists, philosophers, and everybody else in the argument, actually arguing that people do like wearing yellow socks because it works nicely mathematically. It's uh, to give, to give a, 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 a somewhat similar example in, in physics where this method actually works. It's, it is as if the two, two physicists were trying to calculate the, the free fall of an object and they discovered that the mathematics is much more easier when they actually assume that the friction of air does not exist. That is a very useful assumption it simplifies everything, and it actually makes us see through the whole structure of gravity um, in, in a more nice and elegant way. So having an assumption, which is absolutely stupid, of course, everybody knows that the friction of air does exist. But for the purpose of this exercise, it's a useful trick to, for calculation. 
So it would be as if these two physicists would come to the pub together with the economists and say, you know what we discovered? We discovered that the friction of air does not exist. It's a similar, similar way, 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 of, way of thinking. Of course, everybody knows that friction of air does exist, but unlike the physicists, the physicists will not argue that their assumptions are correct because it's a technical assumption. You can really assume anything you like. But economists actually would. Economists actually would engage in a debate that human beings are rational, utility maximizing, um, egoist, or whatever. In the morning it was an assumption, or in other words, a myth, to explain something that we can't explain, including all the factors, so we only choose a couple. In the morning it was a myth, in the evening it was an article of faith. Um, in, in the old times, we believed stories that were inherited from our forefathers for hundreds and thousands of years, um, which is still somewhat more diligent than believing the myths that you yourself invented last Friday uh, when you were having dinner at Pizza Hut with John. Now, <clears throat> these self-believed myths is exactly what you believe. Uh, let me give another example of this but you believe. I had this debate with uh, my dear friends, economists, in Prague about three months ago. And uh, in the middle of the debate, I was accused, uh, in a nice way, I was accused of being uh, romantic and naive believing on, in goodness of mankind and, and, and all that. To which I said, yeah, 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 I, I, I am very romantic. All the ladies should note that down. And I am very naive, and I'd like to be as naive as I can. And then when I gave it a little bit more thought, in the middle of the debate, I realized, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Who is naive here? Who of us believes that human beings are rational? You believe that human beings are rational. That is what I would call naive. And while we are on the topic of naive, who in this room believes that the economy sh grows every year? Where did you take that from? Is it written somewhere in the Bible? Has it been written in the skies? Or have you been smoking something slightly illegal in most European countries? Where did you take the belief that the economy grows every year by one or two percent? Where did you take that from? That is not rigorous thinking. That is not scientific thinking. That is pure mythology in its purest. And on that mythology, we have built our pension system. We have built our healthcare system our unemployment system, our social system, even the whole system of banking is built on the assumption that things, on average, will grow. Uh, it's a nice belief, it's a very romantic belief, it's a very naive belief, but it's like believing that every day will be a sunny day. It's a, it's a, it's a recipe for a disastrous life. If you believe that every day should be sunny day, and if it isn't, it's your fault, then that is a recipe for a very sad life. Building the economy or the system of economy on the assumption that the economy will grow every year one or two percent is like building a ship on the assumption that favorable winds will always grow, uh, blow. If you build a ship on the assumption that every day good winds will blow, you will build a bad ship. It's not a good ship. That ship will sink if the winds stop blowing, and that boat will sink if uh, a strong wind will come. So uh, mark that in the middle of our scientific age, 
our post-ideological age, we have these inbuilt beliefs, of which I've tried to name a couple, that are a fundamental building stone of the very practical pension system that you have here in Germany, just the way we have it also in Czech Republic. Our pension system is built on the assumption that the economy will grow. It's not an assumption, it's a belief. First of all, of course, the first argument is, but the economy has always grown. Not true. The economy has been measured for the last 136 years. That's when the whole statistic of GDP came into existence. Existence Before that, it was pretty much flat. If you compare the Middle Age household with a Stone Age household, same thing. Wooden chairs, wooden table, firewood, um, pot clays, burning plants and animals to eat. If you teleported somebody from Middle Ages to Stone Ages, it would take him perhaps two months before he realized the, 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 the time shift. And even then, since we started measuring GDP, GDP never went like this. It went like this. I mean, empiric empirically speaking, it was always going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Point number two. Point number three, even if, even if, since the time immemorial, the economy would be growing in a nice little smooth line, always 2%, no possible way to believe that this will go on. Just because it's been, and it hasn't, but just even if GDP statistic would be going up steadily for 6,000 years, that is no way to believe that um, it will continue doing so. Third point. Fourth point, it's not growing. It simply isn't growing. I mean, nobody wants it not to grow, but any possible statistic that you like to take, it is not growing. So obviously, it is possible for the economy not to grow. The assumption that the economy grows is a foul assumption. It's a false belief. In medieval times, we would call that heresy. So now that I'm here among theologists, I, I, am, I, I hope I'll be excused for using a couple of theological argumentations, uh, arguments. Um, there is this difficult passage when Jesus says that, you know, if your faith would be the seed of a mustard, size of a mustard seed, you could move mountains. The classical traditional explanation is, if your faith would be as big, only tiny, but as big as a mustard seed, you could move mountains. Difficult to understand, but that's how, anyway, I was brought up. My way of reading this is uh, believing something new is not as hard as disbelieving something old. That was the problem of the Pharisees. It's not that the Pharisees believed too little. The problem of the Pharisees was they believed too much. And Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and he was saying, only if your faith would be little smaller, even if your faith would be as small as a mustard seed, then you could move mountains. The problem is not that we believe too little, but we believe too much. And that's, in fact, the problem of today. I would even say that the situation with economics today is similar to what we had at the end of the Middle Ages with uh, Christian belief. We are today in a point of uh, crisis of belief. We no longer believe the Catholic truth, but there is no um, John Huss, there is no Martin uh, Luther King. We don't want to believe it, but because there is nothing else to believe, we still believe it. Um, this mismatch of belief, again, uh, in our culture, it is quite common, 
it's actually quite general to believe that beliefs, again, to believe that beliefs are a question of choice, that I choose my beliefs. Uh, it's very nicely demonstrated in, uh, in my favorite genre, which is um, pop movies, especially horror movies. If you are so inclined and you like to watch horror movies, you must have noticed that every horror movie plays the same joke on the viewer. So let's believe it's, uh, it's a vampire movie, and there are vampires in the movie, and they kill people, and you know, you know the story. Always, in these movies, there is a character whom I would describe as a rational doubter, a non-believer, somebody who doesn't believe in vampires. In every movie about zombies, ghosts, vampires, you have it. There's always somebody. It's usually a male. It's always a male. And it's usually a policeman or detective or lawyer or somebody who is connected with the rational ordering of things. And that person is in the movie openly disbelieving vampires or ghosts or, or zombies. The funny moment there is that you are sitting on your couch watching the movie, screaming at the disbeliever, you fool, how can you not believe in vampires? I mean, how possibly could that person die and look at his teeth and, and this and that? You are actually talking to that rational doubter, which is in fact you, in the real, because you don't believe in vampires, do you? But when you watch the movie, you believe in vampires. And you don't understand how stupid, idiot, foolish that rational doubter could be. That is the perfect joke that the horror movies play on us. That joke is on us. When I was younger, uh, I used to watch uh, Star Wars. I still watch them, but I used to watch them a little bit more when I was um, younger. And uh, I always wanted my father to, to, to look at it with me because, you know, you never watch a movie like this. You watch a movie facing the eye of the person who's watching it with you. Notice, when there is a joke in TV, the first thing you do, you look into the eye of your fellow viewer and you laugh with him. So there is this triangle. That's why I wanted my father. I knew this, of course, at the age of six. And I wanted my father to watch uh, Star Wars with me. Now, my father is a pilot, he's a very technical person, and, you know, five minutes into the movie, he would say, nah, that's not stupid. That would never fly. Simply, I mean, the wings are not long enough for the physics to, you know, kick in. And, uh, by the way, these laser blasters, they, sh they, they shoot laser, right? Yes. What speed does laser travel at? At the speed of light, father. Right, so you can't see it approaching you, and you can't, you know, duck it when it comes because it travels at the speed of light. This is nonsense. What you're watching is nonsense. And I always thought, yes, I know it's nonsense, but if you want to watch Star Wars for the one and a half hours that you're actually watching it, you sort of have to believe in alien civilizations, you have to believe in time travel, you have to believe in laser guns, and you have to believe in force. If you don't believe in these things, you can't really watch the movie because you're going to be acting like my father. Now, jokes aside, my radical thesis is the realm of fantasy with which we enter the realm of economics is very similar to the realm which we enter in Star Wars. If I want to do economics, I sort of have to believe that human beings are rational. It doesn't, it, the movie wouldn't make sense without it. I sort of have to believe that there is this utility that people try to maximize. I sort of have to believe that people know what they want, as funny as that sounds from everyday experience. I sort of have to believe that there is a utility maximization function. Without that, the whole exercise of economics would not make sense. You can see the trick quite nicely, and this is the last uh, giveaway of, of the, uh, you know, magicians are never supposed to tell the tricks, but I'm not a magician. Um, the way we write our books, and this is Robert Nelson with whom we had uh, uh, the pleasure to, to, to debate in, in Prague. Robert Nelson is the person who wrote a book called Religion as Economics. I think he was one of the first ones to sort of spot the similarities and rigorously deploy them. And he gives this example of how this happens 
in economics. I don't know how many of you are economists, but those of you who are, you know that we went through a book called Samuelson. Paul Samuelson wrote a book uh, in the 50s. Ironically enough, that book was written in the 50s. We still teach it. Uh, 50 years ago, internet didn't exist. 50 years ago, there was no cell phones. 50 years ago, the whole economy was completely different from today, but we still teach it. That's what it says for modern science of economics. But, um, uh, in that book, uh, the argumentation, and this is a book that the whole generation, it has been replaced only quite recently by very similar books. Uh, <laughs> Uh, like Manq or, or somebody else. Uh, the argumentation is like this. Okay, now, my dear students, I want to teach you to think, again, the word think here, the topic of your, of your conference today. I want, you to, I want to teach you to think like an economist. You've heard this many times, to think like an economist. And of course, if you're a little bit brighter, you immediately ask, Okay, but which one? Marx, or Smith, or Hayek, or Keynes, or Schumpeter, or Veblen? Or was not Veblen an economist? Was he sort of slightly so, you know, sociologist? Which economist do you want us to think like? Surely, dear Paul Samuelson, you don't want us to think like you think. Because it would be much more honest for you to write, I want you to teach to think like I think. This is my ideology, and I want you to be fully indoctrinated by it. These are the beliefs that I hold, and I want you to believe them as well. I said the word belief, I, I should have been slower there. To think like Paul Samuelson thinks is not the end of the journey with that sentence because that sentence still is illicit. Paul Samuelson, the author of three generations of, of economic textbooks, a brilliant man in himself, but nevertheless, um, he doesn't want us to think like Paul Samuelson thinks. He wants us to believe like Paul Samuelson believes. And the way this is done is assumptions. I tried to demonstrate that a little bit in the beginning. In the textbook, it looks like this. I want to prove that, I don't know, market solutions are better than government solutions or vice versa, whatever, doesn't really matter um, for, for this, for this um, exegesis right now. And then he goes through eight pages of rigorous mathematical proves one step by another. In the middle of these eight pages, he pauses because he comes to a mathematical standstill and he says, but because we know that human beings are rational, utility, maximizing egoists, we can continue the mathematics as follows. Four, per, four, four pages later, quad erat demonstrandum, we proved what we wanted and it is proved mathematically that markets distribute goods better than governments. How can you do this? How can you spend seven and a half pages on rigorous mathematical proofs that nobody would ever doubt, and then in three sentences do away with a philosophical, ethical, religious, theological, psychological debate that we have not resolved yet? How can you say that human beings are uh, rational? I mean, this is all the way till today among philosophers, uh, you know, not resolved. You can't resolve the question just by assuming it away. How do you know that human beings know what they want? From psychology, we know that this is extremely complicated, that we have some uh, subliminal desires, rational desires, and super ego, uh, ego desires, and super ego desires, and they fight with each other all the time. This is not so clear. We are not sure that human beings know what they want, and we're not sure that they do what they want. Um, but nevertheless, the result is perfect. 
A student who is not fully sharply aware of these little nuances in philosophical argumentation after eight pages has been fully convinced that it has been mathematically proved that whatever was in the beginning of the proof is truth. This I find is um, uh, uh, sort of another, another um, uh, belief system in, in, in economics. Now, uh, of course, again, going back to the beginning, that we cannot be in ethical vacuum, you cannot be in an ideological vacuum, you cannot be in an ideological vacuum. One has to ask, if this is true, if this is the case, then one has to ask himself a question, what has replaced these belief systems? And of course, my uh, hypothesis is that uh, economics, although it pretends to be neutral, objective, uh, positive, uh, mathematical uh, science, it in fact is a moral school in disguise. Um, in economics, those of you who are familiar with economics, you know that there's been this debate about positive and, uh, and, 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 and normative economics. Normative is you already give your value judgment into the sentence, whereas positive is something where there is no value judgment. Um, and there's been a famous article by, uh, by uh, Milton Friedman uh, called Economics as a Positive Science, where he argues that economics should be a positive science. Um, first of all, the sentence, economics should be a positive science, is not a positive statement. It's a normative statement. There's a, there's a, you know, Friedman happens to believe that it should be something that it isn't. There is a value judgment, there is a value orientation, there is actually a force, there is an ideology behind that. Um, point number one. Point number two, if Milton Friedman said economics should be a positive science, then he also meant that it isn't. Because if it would be, that sentence would be redundant. In physics, you don't have physicists crying, physics should be a positive science, because it is. But in economics, just the fact that we have this discourse actually shows that we are not happy with economics as it is, normative, and we should try to turn economics into something that it isn't, namely, 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 namely positive. Um, these are exactly uh, the fact that mathematics masks. My belief, my contribution to this debate, which has been going on in economics for oh no, 60, 40 years, 50 years or so, um, is that economics is normative, backwards. In other words, you are not allowed to give it your norms, your values, your opinions. It will give you its values, its norms, its prices, its opinions. We call it invisible hand of the market. Another way of calling it would be, uh, or I call it, the unorchestrated orchestrator. You are not allowed to orchestrate it. It will orchestrate you. In practical way, speaking uh, in the middle of 2015, you are not allowed to orchestrate the markets. Do not meddle. Let it be, let it work. There's this very famous song from Beatles. I think they must have been listening to it. Let it be, let it be, let it be, let it work. Laissez faire, laissez passer. Don't meddle, it will meddle with you. In other words, we are guided into the future as we speak into an un, by, sorry, by an unorchestrated orchestrator called the markets. These must not be meddled with, they will meddle with you. So um, what are the beliefs of economics? Well, it would be a, a, a fair philosophical or ethical or theological or psychological discourse to talk about whether human beings are 
utility maximizing egoists. It's an absolutely legitimate debate, of course. The way we've solved this debate is we've assumed it that it is so. In other words, we never even entered the debate. We assumed that that's for, for fact. We ducked the debate. We took one mythological corner of the dispute and we made it not only truth, not only allowed behavior, but natural behavior. So not only it's okay to be egoist, which is a big debate in, in ethical schools, whether mankind will be better off being egoist or altruists, we skip that. So not, not only is it okay for you to be egoist, which is a very strong ethical teaching. That is a very discreet school of ethics. Um, and it's okay in a debate, but we have disembarked the debate and we have postulated that not only it's okay for you to be fully egoist, but there is nothing you can do about it. That you are a full um, egoist. Um, this seems to me uh, ideology in its purest. It pretends to be as, uh, as an assumption, as a sort of a technical thing, but in fact it's a moral school. Another example that I could give you is don't care for, the, for your deeds which is in a way, one way of translating the invisible hand of the market. Follow your own interest and every, you will serve the society best if you serve your own interest. This is what Bernard, this is what Bernard Mandeville wrote his very famous uh, essay on bees. How private benefits, be, uh, how private vice become public benefits. So don't care about the results of what you do only maximize your own selfish utility and this deity called invisible hand of the market will take care of it and the best you can do for the society is to care for your own good. Again, something that we could debate but this is definitely a very strong moral school. Follow your interests. Don't care about the impacts of your deeds. Um, there is no such thing as, uh, as a society. It, that is a very strong moral teaching. Fourth point in this new religion, I would call the religion of economics, which is, by the way, the most global and most ecumenical religion of all, because we all understand that every culture has different gods and different kitchens and different dances and different colors of wear. But there is one economy, there is one growth on which the whole globe agrees. It's a perfect religion for our time and age. And I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying that economics should be taken like any other belief school. Uh, it's even to the point of being actually quite fundamentalist because no other alternatives are sort of allowed in the basic Catholic, Catholic model. Um, I think I'm running out of time. I think I did already. Well, let's assume I, I didn't. Um, uh, at, at, towards the end of my talk, let me also say something in the defense of, 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 of capitalism because I criticize capitalism exactly because I love it. I mean, a movie critique doesn't criticize movies bef because he hates movies, he criticizes movies because he likes movies. A literature critic does not hate literature, he enjoys literature, he wants literature to be better. This is my ground of criticism. Um, uh, in the last five minutes, and then let's go in, into the debate, um, I'd like to focus on uh, um, the most strongest critique of capitalism, which of course comes from Marx and from uh, the neo-Marxists. Um, and my point here is that the Marx and, and the neo-Marxists, they didn't really criticize capitalism, they uh, criticized something else. Um, 
Yesterday I had a debate here in, 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 in the library and, and one of the questions was, well, you know, there are also many sins of capitalism. One of the sins of capitalism is this fierce competition of people cutting their throats for their own interest and also, for example, CO2 emissions. I said, well, I agree that is a bad thing, but that has nothing to do with capitalism. I happen to come from a country which wanted to be communist and our CO2 emissions were triple the amount uh, in any capitalist country. CO2 emissions are a result of industrialization, and industrialization was a dream of communism. So CO2 emissions are nasty, we should do something with them, but it is not something that would be lesser if we'd be communist or, or hippies or, 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 I don't know, something else. Uh, the fact that people are detached from their work, the fact that people are detached from their families, the fact that people are not so talkative as they should be, is again not a feature of capitalism, it is a feature of urbanization. And urbanization was as strong in the communist or wannabe communist countries as it was in um, capitalism. Growth. Third topic that people connect with capitalism. Again, uh, it's actually quite funny because it was the communist regime that wanted to grow, outgrow, and outperform uh, the West. When I was young, we, would, we had these five-year plans and individual uh, effort was monitored and measured much more rigorously than today. Because today you only need to know how the company is doing at the end of the year, whether you're making your ends meet, etc., etc. During the centrally planned system, there was no other checks and balances, so every single half a millimeter of success or not was measured and compared to other companies. Competition, so growth, and, and actually, uh, if you if you read the classics. Uh, it was the, the right-wing classical economists that wanted non-growth societies. Thorsten Webland, for example, as right-wing as you can tea party as you, as, as you can even uh, imagine, he considered the, uh, the, the property of a leisure class, uh, sorry, sorry, property of, of, of the rich class is leisure. In other words, not doing anything. That was the uh, distinguishing mark of a rich society, that ri or rich people, or society, that these people no longer had to grow. So uh, one could also think of the topic of growth as actually being a communist ideology. It was the communist ideology that believed that capitalism is a transitory state of, of um, heaven on earth here, and we have to grow to that. And the right wing was somewhat relaxed about growth. Um, alienation, big topic, fourth topic, big topic of the left. Capitalism brings about alienation. God creates Adam. This was way before money was invented. This was way before banks were there. This was way before labor. This was way before even ethics existed. God creates Adam. And the first emotion that Adam feels is what? Alone. Adam felt alone. Before. God, God said it is not good for Adam to be alone. So God fully admitted or acknowledged the fact that Adam was alone. So this feeling of alone that we all feel inside is not again a feature of capitalism it is a feature what of what Hannah Arendt would call human condition we have been created even in the garden of plenty even in the perfect garden way before the fall even happened not our fault this time we felt alone so what does God do God creates him well first he brings all the animals and Adam cannot find a suitable helper Surprise. 
Then he creates him another person. Again, in, uh, in the history of theology, this duality was always interpreted in the male-female dynamics, with which I, of course, uh, have nothing to add. My contribution would be, well, it was another human being. Never mind it was a man or a female. There was another human being. The triangle, the love relationship between man and God suddenly became a love triangle. And uh, God creates this second being, and he calls it a suitable helper. I don't know how it is in German, but something like suitable helper. Of course, the first question you have to ask here is, what did Adam need help with? That he created a helper, a suitable helper, but yet, yeah, at the end of the day, a helper. So in other words, Adam first feels alone, and then as a remedy to his loneliness, he gets a helper. Suitable or not, helper. And third, Adam must have felt that he is, whatever the calling was, incapable of fulfilling it because God has given him a helper. I don't know what you're supposed to help me with, but the message I'm getting is I'm insufficient. I'm not doing something right. I'm obviously in need of a helper. So you see three mismatches in the creation, even before the whole thing with the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil came into the game. So not our fault. All the way up till then, we didn't do anything. We felt alone, we, feel, we felt in the situation of overemployment and insufficient to do the task, whatever the task was. Not knowing what the task was, first problem. Second problem, not being good at it, whatever it was. <laughs> and, uh, and this alienation, not only Adam felt alone, but a God creates something. It's a creation of his work. It's his work. That thing, within a couple of minutes or days or moments, alienates itself from the creator. So this criticism that Marx has that this capitalist system alienates man from the product of his labor, God was also alienated from the product of his labor, and that product of his labor was called human being. Isn't that the whole lesson of Christianity, that human beings alienated themselves from God? A creation became independent of, or sort of independent of the creator. Okay, I uh, have exhausted you, and I have exhausted my time. Uh, so it's always a custom among us to end on a witty note. So I was listening to Robbie Williams yesterday, and I realized that perhaps the biggest fear of us intellectuals is that the truth is as trivial as the songs from Robbie Williams. Thank you.